Um, now, my last uh, task is just to introduce uh, Megan. Uh, Megan uh, started, I guess, this journey. Well, I don't know if it started, but did, started a PDC in 2011, uh, joined NERP in 2011 and was with them until 2013. Is that right? Yes. Uh, we did a community leaders course in 2015 and joined Transition Banual Network. She started and facilitated Transition Street Group in her court and found... Um, founded Sustainable Greensboro in 2017. She was the co-organizer of Second Transition to a Safe Climate in 2019 and now does her own consulting business to help organizations and people move towards sustainable practices and policies. Uh, and without further ado, I'm going to introduce Megan. Welcome and Hello. Hi everyone. I'm just going to share my screen. Tonight we're going to talk about energy in our homes, how it moves through our world, how we can save it more efficiently and how permaculture fits in. So as Paul just went through, this is my history, but I guess I also just wanted to say when I did my permaculture design certificate in 2011, I remember being asked by the, t the lecturer what I thought I would do with this qualification. And at that point, despite being inspired by it all, I really only had a vague sense that I would teach it somehow to somebody sometime down the track. Um, so, but what I can say absolutely is that doing this course, um, has led me on to many volunteer roles, um, that have brought me to presenting this here to you tonight. So I'm actually really quite stoked to be having that come around so that I actually am using my PDC now. <laughs> so I just wanted to quickly go through some permaculture basics, um, just in case people are not uh, across it. What is permaculture? According to David Holmgren, it's the use of systems thinking and design principles that provide the organizing framework for implementing consciously designed landscapes, which mimic the patterns and relationships found in nature while yielding an abundance of food, fiber and energy for provision of local needs. So the key points that I think we need to pull out here is that because it is quite a long sentence, is that it looks at the whole picture or the whole system, not just a part of it. It's not reductionist. It works with nature, not against it. It aims to consciously design systems using the systems thinking approaches, the particularly ecological systems and what we can learn from, from nature there. And it aims to ensure that all life forms have a fair share of Earth's resources and are looked after. To help in this task, it is underpinned by some ethics and principles, which I'll briefly take you through, and then we're going to focus on just three. Um, so another key point for me that I wanted to point out is that permaculture really embraces complexity. Um, the complexity that you find in natural and man-made systems, they're, they're, it, it's there and we cannot reduce it down without actually um, addressing Oh, you, you can't address everything. Um, sorry, you cannot address one part without addressing the rest of it. Um, and it seeks to engage with that complexity in an effective and ethical way. So permaculture came about uh, with uh, Bill Mollison and David Holmgren in the 1970s. Uh, they'd started by just thinking about land management and agriculture and gardening, and thus it was permanent and agriculture became permaculture. Um, but later the term sort of broadened uh, with David's development of the 12 permaculture principles so that it was just um, permanent culture. And that, that's how the, the word came about. Uh, it also, that meant that it became a framework that could be applied to any system or organizational structure. And at its core is a belief that nature's ecosystems give us examples of how things can run with little or no waste while supporting all life so that they can continue in perpetuity. So the three ethics that it is underpinned by are earth care, people care and fair share. So earth care is about caring and protecting the environment and all life forms on the planet. People care is protecting and sustainably providing for ourselves and other peoples um, and to build that strong resilient community. And fair share is understanding the limits of nature so that we only take what we need and make sure there is some for everyone else. The 12 permaculture principles encircle the ethics and they work together. So by using the pr principles to design your systems, you are embodying the ethics. 
um, caring about ourselves and other beings in the world is always therefore front and center through decision-making opportunities. These are the 12 principles and um, I'm not going to go through all 12 of them tonight. We're going to focus on the first three, which are observe and interact, catch and store energy and obtain a yield. If you want to know more, like I'll, it, it, I really do recommend looking into it further, but they're the three that we'll look at now. So principle one, observe and interact. Uh, David Holmgren gives a, a picture on the, on the side there that encapsulates it, but also a, um, a, a, a little epitaph to be able to describe it and a quote. By taking the time to engage with nature, we can design solutions that suit our particular situation or beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Now, this one is about perform It really encourages us to uh, stop before we uh, do anything and make any big changes to our systems to stop and observe and interact and work out what is going to happen or what's going to work best in that situation. What are the opportunities and the constraints? What solution will give the best immediate and ongoing outcomes? And it's really important that this, to note that this one is um, essential for being able to achieve success in the other principles as well, because it's, this is how you get the data that you need to be able to, um, to work through things. Catch and store energy uh, is principle two. By developing systems that collect resources when they are abundant, we can use them in times of need. Or in other words, make hay while the sun shines. So what sort of resources do you have available to you? How can you capture them for immediate and future use? And think beyond just solar energy and food. Stored water is also a great force in nature, as is soil health and carbon capture by trees. So this principle is about reminding us the cyclical state of nature. It's um, it, it's about how gardens capture the sun and, and convert it into food. Um, but it's, yeah, it's really not just talking about um, food. Water, um, the, the water example, stored water, for, uh, a dam is a way of capturing water in wet winters and springs for the hard summer months. And then the slope, if you put it up, up above, um, the slope will gravity feed it down. and without any further energy input required. So catch and store for later use is that principle. And obtain a yield is ensure that you are getting truly useful rewards as part of the work that you are doing or you can't work on an empty stomach. So this, is, um, this principle is the practical one. It forces us to recognize that if we are not working in a system which sustains us, that system and we um, will not survive. So you need to be earning an income to support your life in the present moment. Um, I think it's been quite obvious in um, this pandemic lockdown that you can't create, engage in creative design thinking if your basic needs are not met. Um, so, so many people have, have found that one out, that, that limit the hard way. Um, but it's not just about money. Uh, what other capital can you harvest? Um, so things like uh, if you think about the sun and how you are um, uh, harvesting that, if you've got excess and you put it in back into the grid, you know, you're, you're obtaining a yield there, which you then share with other people. Um, or if you've got excess food growing in your garden, you can um, take that to a food swap um, or a, another group to be redistributed. So um, obtaining a yield isn't just about um, making money it's it, it's the practical one in that it, that it acknowledges that that is essential but it's also it still goes back to being able to share that around so we come to our first breakout discussion there okay so the two main laws of thermodynamics um the law of conservation is first energy can neither be created nor destroyed energy can only be transferred or changed from one form to another um, and then the law of degradation is that as energy moves through systems, some of the energy loses its ability to do work and is degraded in quality as it moves towards entropy. And then entropy is always increasing. So energy and permaculture is about recognizing, utilizing and replacing all types of energy in whatever form it is found 
as it flows through our natural and human systems. Just to give you another take on it, I've got Mollison's preferred definition of energy, which is that all energy entering an organism population or ecosystem can be accounted for as energy which is stored or as energy that leaves. Energy can be transformed from one form to another, but it cannot disappear, be destroyed or created. No energy conversion system is ever completely efficient. And what that's referring to is that, um, that as, as it moves towards entropy, its uh, energy becomes unavailable for work because it's not useful anymore to the system. So um, that definition comes from Kenneth Watt um, and it's, it's the one that Bill Mellison puts forward. And I guess what it's really getting at is uh, what's some important points to take out are that when I first came across this, I thought, oh, it can't be created. Well, when you turn on a light, it's like it suddenly appears, you know, it's like it's been created, but it's not. It's actually come from a whole lot of, you know, along that power cable that's, that's been generated um, from uh, usually, in the, at least in the past, coal and oil and now solar. So um, it's been transformed from either the sun energy or from the fossil fuel energy into something that can travel along a wire, come to your house and then be utilised. Um, so it, it can only transform from one form into another. You can't create it. And so that was sort of a bit of a um, something that um, woke me up a little bit that, to, that I have to think about it more. And um, in terms of the not being efficient, um, not being completely efficient, it makes, it makes sense as things go along, they become less and less useful to the system. Um, such as when we convert petrol into energy to make the car go, it comes out as exhaust and, and that's not really useful to anyone at the moment. Um, maybe in the future we can work out a way to recycle it, but... Um, not yet. So why is understanding energy important? Well, uh, Mollison points out that it, it, is the most, it is the most stable, adaptable and sustainable systems are those that, that are those that make the best use of the energy available to them to support the basic needs of its inhabitants and then give energy back so it can continue to thrive. So if you are not um, using energy most efficiently um, to be able to support your basic needs, then that system is going to fall over and it's, it, it really puts you in dire straits. Um, so it's really important that we get our head around this because we're, this is the direction we're heading in, that our earth is not going to be able to support us anymore. Um, so another important point um, about why it's important Another important point is that it's as much about the energy that you don't use as making the most of the energy that you do use. So a good design will cut your carbon footprint and your bills. Um, and because of the, this reduction of consumption, and that's just as important as buying energy efficient appliances. Um, you can design to gain multiple benefits from the one intervention, which saves energy and resources. And I've got a good example of that um, with our water tanks uh, after the next, in the next section. And I think it's also, it, it brings, it makes it really um, clear that we need to, if we can reuse or repurpose something that already exists, then we should, um, even if it looks old and, um, not very polished or whatever, it, we should use it. And the bathtub on the side there, that's next to our driveway. Um, and my husband saw it on the side of the road and we thought, beauty, it's a wicking bed. Um, and we picked it up, made a frame for it. And it's made that space usable. Uh, it's north facing. It's raised it up so that you could use it because we, we, there is a, a smaller garden bed under there, but it's, it's like literally this, this wide and we tried a um, passion fruit there and you know how they're not, they're not easy to kill, but it, it died. Um, and uh, so when we found this bathtub, I thought that's great, strawberry bed, um, because strawberries are very thirsty and um, 
it's in a quite a warm spot on our property so we can um, utilize this resource uh, with very little extra stuff added to it um, to be able to keep using it. The other thing to note is that if you have um, inputs that outweigh the system's requirements and its ability to process those that input, then you get that's when you get pollution. So again, thinking of car exhaust, particulate matter, um, it's the atmosphere's inability to clean it as fast as we can make it is what makes it pollution. Um, or when organic material is put in landfill, which is an anaerobic environment, uh, it cannot break down those organics and instead releases methane that cycles through Earth systems incredibly slowly and then adding to the greenhouse gases and our future problems. So in, in and of itself, that, that organic material that's going to landfill is not a problem, but you put it in um, if, if it goes through the appropriate system. But if you put it in a system that is not conducive to it being reutilized, then it becomes pollution. So in this modern mindset of solving the waste problem by putting it in a bin so it's gone, that I think that's something that we really need to, to take a look at um, because uh, it's a fantasy. We, we need to, if, if it goes in the bin, it's not, it's not a way, it's just someone else's, somewhere else's problem or someone else's problem. So taking responsibility for what you bring into your system um, is, is that mindset change that uh, I really think um, we need to address. And uh, designs, permaculture designs, that ensure that all outputs from one system are taken up as inputs for the next system or circular thinking um, is, is definitely something that we should aim for. And I've just put a little picture of the seven R's of zero waste living. It's just one of many different models that you can use, but at, right at the top is refuse and reduce um, what you bring into your home and then reuse, recycle, rehome, replant or rot what you can't continue to use in its form, current form, change it, make it something that's useful um, in a different form. So this is uh, a picture from Rosemary Morris Earth Gu User's Guide to Permaculture. If you're looking for an introductory text to permaculture, it's very accessible. Um, and this uh, image is talking about how energy cycles through systems. And in particular, this is the, the most basic energy system that allows for life on Earth. So the solar energy from the sun um, goes to the herbivores, the carnivores, and then, um, which includes us, so we're in the middle of that. And then it, we put the scraps into the compost and then it goes through to the worms and the, the microbacteria and um, all of that sort of stuff, which goes back to the trees um, to make more food for us. So, and then it keeps on cycling around and cycling around. And um, according to Mollison, that's, you know, it's basically infinite the amount of times that that can go around if you've got the system set up well. Um, as humans, we've become very adept at harvesting this energy uh, from the primary and secondary producers, but seem to have forgotten about um, giving back an equal amount to the, or an equal or greater amount so that we can continue the cycle. Um, and that's where it's really important that we see that we're just using up our future um, nutrients, the, the nutrients for our future. Um, and then we're trying to put those nutrients that we have taken out um, by not composting and um, adding it in artificially with uh, commercial fertilizers and so forth. Um, and it, the, it, that system is, is currently broken um, of our food system. So we, we really need to address this. Um, and the other one that really gets my goat is commercial bread because um, they have flour, which has the vitamins and minerals in it. They process it so that all those nutrients uh, are removed and then they have to put them back in again um, artificially because they haven't um, 
because they've taken them out. So it's just, it seems a bit crazy to me. And um, it's one of the things that I, I, I'm looking to um, get in an area that I'm looking to get into in the future. But this is just one energy system. And I really want you to start thinking about um, others that you might see around you because once you start looking, they're everywhere. Um, there's different types of energy. Energy takes different forms as it moves through systems as well. For example, energy from the sun is called electromagnetic energy and then it gets turned into um, the, the chemical energy of the plants and, um, and then into food. Uh, it, there's mechanical energy there, so the energy that can make things move. There's thermal energy, nuclear energy, sonic energy from sound, gravitational energy, like there's all these different types. So this, this isn't an exhaustive list. Um, there's so many different types of energy. And I think, you know, when we're in, in our culture, we really only, when we say energy, we think of solar energy or fossil fuel energy, but we really need to start um, looking for and um, bringing together our, all those other types of energy so that we can more, effectively and efficiently use um, use it before it leaves our system. Um, it says, can you think of any others? But the last thing I want to um, talk about is also the people energy, um, zone zero, zero. This is uh, something that Luby McNamara says, um, has brought forward and she, she's talking about it as it's self care. Okay, so it's zone zero, zero. You're, it's, it's about you and it's self care and it's vital on our pathway towards a positive future for all. If we don't care for ourselves, will someone else do it for us or is it just going to get left undone? And I think it's really, um, us, us in Melbourne have had a um, crash course in this one in particular that we've really had to focus on our, our energy and where we're, where it's going and where it needs to go and and reaching out so that we can get some um, for ourselves or um, help someone else so yeah I'd like you to sort of think about that as a different type of energy and it's it's one that's not often um, not often recognized um, but people is people's energy is um, capital too and we, we need to really think about that in particular in regards to business um, so at my last job I felt like a number and um, in fact I barely even felt I felt invisible almost a big cog in a machine uh, that doesn't care uh, about the people working for it um, and it's this kind of attitude by business, the, where we've got to, uh, it means that people aren't connected to their workplace like they used to be. And I really think that there's a lot of um, investigation we need to do there as a culture, as a society. Um, but we haven't got time to go into that today. <laughs> so uh, it's a very interesting idea to look into if you're keen. But I want you to sort of think about the levels of energy in yourself and the persons in your household, in your community, um, you know, is there all of that as you sort of work your way out? Um, I, I still feel like self-care is about um, reaching out to those in your community as well. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the discussion on energy. And I guess I just really wanted to uh, do another breakout discussion. Where... Oh, welcome back. I think that's all of us. So hopefully you had a bit of a, um, an opportunity to have a, a discussion in your group. And I'd love to hear um, just from the different groups oops, uh, about what some of the things that you talked about were. Yeah, so we talked about energy between people, um, auras, um, and the energy that you can put into cooking food if you're cooking with a good attitude and that there's actually i think it's curly in photography but there's some evidence to show um you know that there can be photos that show this energy 
around living things. And then we went on to talking about trees and that they can actually communicate um, through the mycorrhiza, through the contact between roots. And there's just so much in the world that Westerners don't really know much about. And we do well to listen to lots of people. Um, so the mycorrhiza and the importance of soil health and the potential for um, helping with climate change by building the carbon content, by building up the soil. So that's a quick overview of our discussion. It's a fantastic, and that, that uh, the importance of soil as potential energy is just such a huge one. I mean, it's just, it is the ultimate seed, seed library, isn't it? Because there are so many seeds that, but that exist. But it's also the potential for reversing climate change. Mm -hmm. Yep. That, um, you know, people talk about trees, but soil's an even bigger resource from what I've been reading lately. Yep. Fantastic. Excellent. Thank you. Now, uh, who else would like to add? And if you just notice in the, um, in the chat, I'm just adding some notes so that people can build on each other's ideas. I can go. Mm, so we talk about volunteering. Um, and also storing energy, I guess, water energy in water tanks. Um, and we also talk about sharing seedlings at workplaces and, um, and that how that actually generates, um, I guess, that social um, goodwill, you know, social capital. So that's another form of energy generated um, as well. And talk a bit about um, using kids' energy um, for instance, um, events like Clean Up Australia. And also around the house, I gave some examples how, you know, since everyone's at home, I have three kids. Um, I get them to do work for me in the garden, looking after the quails, doing housework, helping with cooking and shelling beans and things like that. And um, yeah, I mean, I think if you find something fun for them to do, you know, they willingly do it. <coughs> um, harnessing some of that energy um, and also we talk about composting and um, worm farm and I, I guess in hindsight you know there's also a form of storing energy in um, yeah in in a good compost and worm casting that can improve the soil so, yes, yes. fantastic and the, the using of children is is also uh, a, a, an example of potential energy because you're skilling them up to you know to generate more energy in the future and the last group. So I'll summarise very briefly by saying we talked about, um, I guess, the, the importance to each of us to invest our energy in our community group communications more effectively mm -hmm. um, and more broadly our energy that we put into community groups, um, being selective about where we invest that. And then we moved into talking about making sustainable living in general and energy use, thinking about energy use um, more appealing to the masses, mm -hmm. um, which we've been grappling with for a while and will continue to do so, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Fabulous. Thanks. Appealing to the masses. So that's a really good, and I think this uh, harks back to uh, what Megan was talking about, about the importance of observing and interacting as a, like a central uh, tenet of permaculture, that we're now thinking more broadly about sort of the energy and the energy that's cycling through our properties and our lives. So we've covered a lot of ground. We've, we've looked at some of the first uh, principles of permaculture and uh, explored the, the movement of energy and those laws of basically those of thermodynamics. We've looked at some of the, the issues that can, I guess, be caused. Uh, and I think the, the, the plan now is to move a little bit more into a sort of more specific application of it. Now we are up to the practical applications of the principles and of the um, discussion we've been having about energy. So I want to share with you a few key design interventions at my house. But I do want, also want to say here that I'm conscious that my experience will not be everyone's, uh, cannot be everyone's, and the solutions I offer will not work for all. But that it's okay, because permaculture informs us that the solutions need to be localised, right down to the household if, or the, the person, if um, necessary, to be appropriate. 
Uh, plus, I also uh, fully embrace that it's the diversity of experiences, knowledge and opinions that make our community more resilient and stronger um, because we need uh, solutions for every situation. So I hope that you can still get something out of this, even if your situation is different. All right, so saving on heating. Um, the first and most important thing to do is draft proofing. And this story might tell you why. When we moved in, it took us a couple of years of freezing winters every time we walked down that hallway. Um, it, we, we, we've got a 1960s brick veneer home um, and it only had one person own it before. So, you know, it, it was all going really well until we started looking down under and on top of and inside of wardrobes and cupboards and realised that there was massive gaps, like I'm talking like a centimetre plus um, of a gap uh, right, um, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but right up, the, the red arrow on the left pointing under the door or, or the photo on the right, up underneath that um, the floor, the fake floor, was a, a gap that went straight to the under, under the house and uh, we're up on stumps. So there was cold air drafting in through there on three cupboards um, all year round and um, once we realised that, we, we worked out why the tiles were so cold and my husband quickly plugged it up. But once we started looking, we were finding it, we, we had to get in the wardrobe and look back out to see that they hadn't also um, hadn't uh, done cording, I think it's called, for uh, the this side. Uh, can you see where my mouse is? I'm not sure. Yeah, so they hadn't done quadding on this side. So you had to stick your head in everywhere and, and look where you can't usually see. So if you've got an old house, I strongly suggest that you, you, you get down on your hands and knees. You get up on ladders and chairs, well, safely, of course, um, and, um, and look at all those places that you can't see when you're just walking around um, because corners can sometimes be cut. Uh, the other place that uh, it was really apparent was around our windows and our, our doors. Um, we've had to plug them with uh, the foamy stuff uh, and add uh, draft stoppers to the bottoms of the doors. Um, the windows were a big problem. It was, um, uh, there was um, three mil thick glass, and I'll talk a bit more about that on the next slide, but three mil thick glass, a gr yeah, glass, and um, it was just, the, the heat was just going straight out, um, and the, the heat in summer was coming straight in. So, um, yeah, these are the things of an old house that you might need to, to think about and check out. You want to stop the drafts. Uh, it's not just about drafts, it's the other things you can do that are pretty low tech. I know someone was asking for some low tech, um, cheaper options. Um, can you put an extra layer of clothing on before you turn the heater on? Um, sometimes it's, you know, sometimes it's just cold and you need that, that extra heat, but an extra layer of clothing might get you through. Uh, around 18 to 20 degrees we find is optimal. Uh, I have the heater set at 18 and then we sort of turn it up whenever we need to, to 19 and 20 as a maximum. Um, but sometimes, you know, some people go for even cooler at 16. Uh, with kids, I just found that that wasn't really feasible for us at the moment. Uh, but overnight, we do not heat the house. We, we let it cool off. That's another thing is you don't want your heater on all, all night. It actually, you sleep better if it cools down. Um, to minimise, uh, oh, sorry, the windows and doors, um, if you've got kids, you need to make sure they cut, uh, close them after after leaving the house. Uh, that was a big thing for us all winter. So we're, we are working hard to be consistent about that so that as it goes on, they will close the doors. Um, and if you can't heat your whole house effectively, could you just make one room particularly warm and comfortable by shutting some doors? Um, so insulation. Uh, I've put this diagram in here because it's it's quite instructive about where you might want to do uh, your insulating first. So uh, if you haven't insulated your ceiling, 30% goes out through the ceiling. So um, that's the one that we, we've done first. We've got our 
roof cleaned out and fresh new insulation put in. That's another thing about 1960s houses. Ours was apparently insulated with seaweed. Uh, I have no idea why. Um, who thought that was a good idea? I'm not sure, but apparently highly flammable and we're lucky the house didn't burn down. So um, <laughs> recommend getting that checked out. Um, and the, 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 the insulation that was in there was also very old and very flattened. Um, but windows lose 25%. So if you can get double or triple glazed windows, um, we did this and oh, the, the difference was amazing. We love our windows. So if you can do that, um, it's definitely, if, you, if you're doing a new build, go straight for the double at the least. Um, but until we had the, the, the windows, we, uh, the new windows, we installed some floor length curtains with helmets. So this window, uh, this photo is a bit hard to see, but this is the helmet at the top and it goes almost, well, it did go to the floor when the carpet was there. Um, but the reason that's important is because there's a convection current that actually cycles the heat from your room and um, pass the glass, the cold glass, so that the heat all transfers out. Remembering that we're talking about cycles of energy here, um, that it goes all the way and then um, out the bottom of the curtain as cold air and then um, keeps on sucking more if you don't have a helmet to interrupt it. With double, <clears throat> excuse me, with double glazed windows, we don't need them anymore for that reason, but. Um, they're still really helpful for keeping out the heat in summer. So we're really glad we've got those. Um, the walls are 20% uh, and if you can get um, wall insulation put in, uh, then that's definitely worth doing because we still do notice it, even with the ceiling and the windows, we've, you know, we still do notice that, um, that there is some heat loss through the walls. And our floor, like I said, we're up on stumps. so we're going to get underfloor insulation as well. So, you know, all the energy is coming in. And if you don't actually have this insulation to keep it in, then you are, you are, you're losing that resource. It is, it's just dissipating and you're not getting very much benefit from it. So um, really worth looking at insulation after draft proofing or in, in concert with. Then we go to the other end of the spectrum to summer. And um, this is something I did a blog about last year, but it's worth showing again. We had external blinds when we first moved in and they were good, but we found that it made the room seriously dark. So, and you, they're not the kind of thing you want to go in, out and put up and down often. Um, so, and they also interrupted airflow. So we decided once we got the windows done, those had to come out and we weren't going to put them back. And, but we, um, then we're, well, what do we do in summer? And so Graham came up with sticking shade cloth down from the gutters. Um, some people might not be too comfortable with that. And like I said, that's, you know, this is not going to work for everyone, but for us, it works really well. We just drop it down. It cuts the light, but it doesn't um, make it dark in the room. It's not really, really dark. And, and the other thing that it's really good at that we've noticed is that because it covers the bricks of the house at the front here, because it covers the bricks, it actually stops them heating up quite as much um, with the westerly sun. So this face is west. And um, because it stops the bricks heating up, they're not acting as um, a, car, a, a, a heat um sink as in they're, they're not uh, what's the thermal they're not a thermal um capture uh, mechanism and um they don't radiate that heat back into the, our bedroom when we're trying to sleep at night so uh there has been a five to ten degrees difference in um our bedroom and that's just me um i haven't measured it uh, my husband's working on some sensors to measure it this year. Um, but on a 40 degree day, it's so much more, um, uh, e so much easier to be in that bedroom. Um, so, but yeah, they're temporary, so they can come down. Then we get to our garden. So um, we've got a 580 square uh, metre suburban block and approximately a third of it is garden, some kind of green. 
we have done a quick tally and there seems to be around 150 different plants on our property and at least a hundred of them are edible. And we've got a food forest now that's about nine years old. So it's very close to gaining that, that um, 10 year birthday um, of being much more self-sustaining by that point. So that's exciting. So that's the stats of our garden. This is what it was when we moved in. So it's in our front yard and it was a dust bowl <laughs> um, and it had two big trees in it and this um, really uh, not very pleasant tree out the front here. It didn't, didn't really do much for me that one. Um, and it was this pretty standard suburban, 1960s suburban house frontage. But the, every summer the grass was dead. The soil was, um, the top soil was about a centimetre or two. And it just wasn't, um, wasn't producing or able to support anything. And then a year or so after we moved in, um, the tree fell down just randomly and luckily fell roadway rather than on our house. Um, so it was a big liquid amber and it was, it was rotten on the inside. It just fell over, which um, using permaculture principle number 12, uh, use and respond creatively to change, we decided to, that that meant suddenly we had a huge front yard that we could do something with. Um, so that was our first attempt at a veggie patch out the front there and we re-landscaped it um, and did all that and now this is this is it here now um, and this isn't even the best photo but I wanted to take it from this angle so that you could see um, the difference but now the food forest is in there and it's growing up and it is going to become our um, natural air conditioning so eventually we hopefully won't need that shade cloth over our window because the trees will be big enough to be um, to be that block for us. So we've carefully chosen some plants that um, will allow lighting in, uh, in, in winter, so deciduous ones, as well as some that aren't. Um, we get produce from it, we um, get the cooler air, and you, like I, I have to, on the 40 degree days, I made a point of going out and standing under the trees in our food forest, and again, you could feel the difference. It was, it was really amazing. Um, so yeah, this is the food, our front yard from the other direction. Um, importantly, it also protects, also protects our soil uh, so it can be more productive and use less water. Um, even though there's more plants in there, um, they, the, the soil is protected so it's not evaporating at the same, the same rate. So we haven't noticed a huge uptick in our water. Um, this is just some of what we've got in um, in our food forest. So uh, all of the things that are sort of more permanent. We've got the upper story, we've got four varieties, apricot, plum, pear, lime, pomegranate, mulberry, fajoa, and then a lower story of shrubby layer of cherry guavas, peach, nectarine, mandarin, fig, jossaberry, curry bush, cape gooseberry, kiwi berry. Um, ground covers, root crops and climbers. So they're all in there and you can see in this picture, this is in front of the other bedroom and the mulberry tree is here, it's the dwarf one. So um, it's going to be the shade for this window. Um, it's a bit crazy in there at the moment, uh, but we've got a Cape gooseberry up here, raspberries against the fence. Um, there's some kind of herby thing, flowery thing down there. There's a um, some nice flowers, straw flowers here, lavender, azalea, because it survived somehow. <laughs> that was from the original garden. Don't know how it survived. Um, coriander, uh, clover, and a kiwi berry underneath the Cape gooseberry. So we'll see how that goes with them sharing the space. Um, so yeah, it is possible to squeeze a lot of stuff in there. Um, and just to give you an idea of our yield um this is 10 months so from december last year to october this year uh, we've picked over 200 kilos of produce um, but that sort of doesn't convey the volume of stuff so obviously lettuces don't weigh that much um, if we had to pack it in boxes i'm sure there'd be a lot of more boxes 
Uh, I've also estimated how much it would be worth if you bought it from an organic produce shop, and that's around 2,200. Some of the highlights are 19 pumpkins in two varieties of 33 kilos worth, uh, over 2,000 cherry tomatoes of five varieties at 16 kilos, 123 zucchinis um, at 66 kilos. And if you look at this here, it's one, it was one of those trombocini zucchinis or something like that. And they were just monsters, um, a bit more like a pumpkin than a zucchini really by that point. Um, and uh, 21 pomegranates at three kilos. So yeah, this one here sort of shows you also the pears, the passion fruit, um, some basil, when we were getting eggs from our chickens, which are also in that front yard. I don't know if I said that. Um, so that's our front garden. It's supported by having tanks. And this is, this is one of the, the examples, um, best examples, I think, of on our property of one thing, one intervention, doing multiple tasks all at once. So we had a wider than usual side alleyway and um, it's four 2,000 litre tanks down the side of that house. And I chose a light cream colour so that it would reflect light into the house. Not really knowing if it would work, to be honest, but um, knowing that the dark one would certainly not help. Um, and it did. The south facing bedroom and the bathroom, we don't use a light in there on, um, during the day. Um, the, the, it, it's as bright as, almost as bright as um, the other room, which is uh, westerly facing. Um, so that was really quite successful. Uh, then the vertical space that that allows um, to, these are struts that are off the, the thing that the tanks are sitting on with wire between and that's grapes and berries along there. Um, so they're sort of sharing that space and I'm pretty proud of myself. I actually managed to prune them um, properly this year. So <laughs> we're starting to see some good results from that now. Uh, I was like, phew, didn't cut off all of the fruiting spears. <laughs> um, so yeah, having some vertical space in a, in a narrow area, um, that, that's another good thing. And it also does create in summer a bit of a um, canopy, which keeps it cooler down there as well as an extra thing. Um, the vines are deciduous, so we get them more light in winter. And it does provide some privacy from the neighbors but it also allows us to store water at the top point of our property. They're all connected. And um, the, the back garden bed that I showed you earlier is gravity fed off, off these. Um, so in that case, we're saving energy by not using the pump. And I think that's really important as well. Another concept I really wanna get across tonight is that it's, it's, it's about as what that you can design so that you're not using that energy um, if you don't have to. So yeah, um, other things, other little things that you can do for lighting um, it, it are the turning the lights off when you leave the room. That's a habit that you can get into. Um, also turning off your standby power if um, it adds around 10% if you didn't know to your yearly power usage. Um, and if you can just get into the habit of turning it off at the wall, then you'll you save that. And that's, you know, that's a huge saving. And if you haven't changed your light globes yet, um, that's definitely something to do. There was um, a bit of a question, uh, Megan, from Tanya sure. about the order of planting for your food forest. She said, did you need to grow your or plant okay. your things in a certain order? Um, no, it was a very organic pro process. Um, the upper story, you, you kind of want to get that going as soon as possible because, um, well, they've got to get big. Um, and to start protecting the, the lower story. So well, actually, yeah, I guess there was an order. Um, because what I found was that because the soil wasn't great and um, because it was such harsh sun in summer, I couldn't plant uh, things that were a bit more, um, uh, what's the word, um, uh, sensitive uh, to sun 
until the upper story um, and the mid story had sort of really started to come on. So now that they're established, then the 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 ground is it's just exploding now. So um, yeah, I guess it, I started at the top and then kind of tried some lower things and they weren't working. Um, so we, we focused on soil health with that and really laying down um, uh, um, laying down the green cover crops and stuff like that so that we could uh, improve the soil enough so that it could support the, the, the more uh, fragile plants. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so. Uh, can, can I just uh, add, if you're gonna plant Jerusalem artichokes, just make sure you really like Jerusalem artichokes. Yeah, that's <laughs> something that, we, we, yeah, we're not, we're not a huge fan, but um, they, and also choose your spot wisely because once you put them in, they don't go away. So um, you, you, you need to, they need to be something that you're happy to keep popping up in the same spot. <laughs> same with comfrey, by the way. <laughs> um, okay. So then we come back to com like compost, the kitchen, I guess is sort of what this one is about. And um, it's not just about the oven or the cooktop. It's not about, although, you know, we are hoping to get the induction cooktop uh, next, next year sometime. Uh, it's about seeing all the items, all the pro products that you bring into your kitchen as resources and potential resources beyond their first use um, to use to their fullest before letting them leave your kitchen system. Um, so, for example, we, we do still eat meat, um, but I try and buy organic or free range wherever possible. So if I get some chickens free range or organic chickens, um, I buy the frames so that I can make chicken stock and then um, cook them up and then I've got bones left. And I decided that I really wanted to, you know, that's my nutrients. I paid for those. <laughs> For, uh, for one thing and for another it's my responsibility to deal with these rather than sending them to landfill um putting them in compost didn't seem like it uh wasn't wasn't a good option for the rodent factor so um we buried them i decided to bury them and i did an experiment and in summer i can tell you it seems to take about two months but in winter it's more like three to four um and i buried them and i put a brick a couple of bricks on top so that um uh, they couldn't be dug up again by whatever um and yeah like now there's this this is what it was like i think that's about two frames there and then this is what it um they're the only bits of bone that i found three months later um and that's just dumping it in the ground like literally dug a hole dumped it in put some bricks on top and left it um and there are so many worms up in this section now where I've been doing this. Um, I think you can also get uh, those um, cone bins, um, which apparently are really good for breaking down bones as well. Uh, so if you can get one of those, but I haven't been able to get one yet. So because um, of lockdown and everything, so I just was like, well, I'm burying them then. Um, and yeah, that's one of the things I've sort of has really changed with my thinking is that if it was once alive, it should be able to be broke to be able to break down in the soil. So massive amounts of citrus, you know, people are like don't put it in your compost. I'm like, well, I'll just bury it. Like it's, it's it, it should be able to break down. It might take a long time. It might take longer than, but if you've got the space on your property um, to be able to just bury it in the corner and leave it, um, we've had great success and a huge amount of worms come up um and into those spots where we have just been burying our compost burying our uh burying our um, food scraps and our bones um so it's it's worth trying do an experiment if you're a bit skeptical that's fine um but yeah if you're going to eat meat i figure we need to take responsibility for the entire process and um and and put that back in the soil uh, pizza boxes is another one that uh, people are like, what do you do with them? Because you can't recycle them because they've got grease on them. Well, you can put them in the compost or give them to the worms. Um, and on the topic of worms um, and worm farms, we on the right here is 
what used to be our worm farm and uh, unfortunately that was not a successful one. <laughs> um, the worms died in that one. We got given this on a um, one of those uh, tours by um, can't remember one of those groups um, and it's just two polystyrene boxes got a couple of holes in the bottom here um, yeah this one has been successful they love it in there they're, they're thriving and everything is cool um, so yeah I think it's worth but then we didn't want to waste this so my daughter actually came up with turning this into a wicking bed for strawberries um, again you like the one out the front you know they're very thirsty so i was like okay let's do it so um and the you can't see it but the tap is what allows the water to drip out when it's raining i, I made sure to look out the window and it actually does work so um yeah and then the last one uh, last to sort of talk about people energy is utilizing kid energy so uh, Yenny did an excellent job of um, bringing up the points on this slide. So I won't, I won't labor it, but it builds a sense of belonging to the family. They have excess energy to burn. So why not do it helping you so that you take the pressure off the parents. Um, but more, more importantly, uh, as Paul said, we're, we're teaching them how to do the tasks that they will need to know how to do as adults. So, you know, it, it's, it behooves us as well to make sure that they know how to do this stuff. So. Um, if possible, when you make the task ones that they find interesting and within their skill set, you'll get better res results. Um, but what I've really found is that you need to, if it's a new skill, make sure you demonstrate it and how to do, do it effectively. Because a couple of times I've like, do that. And they're like, <laughs> and, the, and that's when I'm like, oh, yes, small person need to um, actually show them what I'm talking about. Um, Seems obvious, but it's, it's come up a few times as a parent, as I'm sure other parents know. Um, and then make sure you value their input, celebrate their achievements and have fun with them with it um, so that they're not chores. They're actually them learning how to be part of your family unit, um, how to contribute effectively to your family unit and how to be good adults in the future. So I know this is about energy and I haven't really talked about energy at all um, in the way that it's mostly understood by our, um, our society. So here is our energy stats, our energy usage for 2019-20. Um, we used 1,603 kilowatt hours, which is 4.4 kilowatt hours a day, which, uh, and we, we generated uh, 3,890 kilowatts. And uh, so the energy, because, you know, obviously in winter, you don't have as much uh, across the year, it cost us $438.49 um, for the whole year. Now, the average Green Spire household electricity usage, and this is pre-COVID, um, so that's worth recognising, but it's from a government um, compare energy website thing, that is 15.8 kilowatts a day, which just um, staggers me a little bit we are using 28% of what the average Greensboro household apparently uses. Now, there is one caveat that, um, that some people, some households might be on more electrical appliances than we are, because um, we do have gas. So I added them together. And even when you're using gas, and obviously the gas isn't as efficient as the electricity hopefully will be when we convert, um, we're still just using 55% of the average Greensboro household. That's pre-COVID. Um, we're hopefully going all electric in 2021. So, um, and getting more panels so that we can up our generation as well. So on the subject of generation, we have 15 panels installed nearly two years ago. Um, so a bit of comparison, the month of January, 2018, we used 218 kilowatt hours, paid $108. And in January 2019, we used only 78 kilowatt hours and got paid $26. So there was a drop of 64% over the summer, um, only a drop of 29% in winter, but still a drop. Um, for the lifetime of the panels, we've produced 10 megawatt hours of power. We've exported 45% of that power. So we've only used 55% of it. Um, and 
yeah, imported this three megawatt hours, uh, but we've been paid nearly $900 in feed-in tariffs. And that imported power was bought either as green power or carbon offset power. So um, yeah, that's, that's sort of where we're at with um, our energy usage. And that's because of all of the interventions that we've done um, that I've, most of which I've shared with you that have allowed us to decrease our consumption to the point that um, it's, it's pretty low, I feel. I'd, I'd be keen to know what other people are able to achieve as well. So we've got one more workshop discussion time. So I'm going to stop sharing that. Feel free to add. You may continue adding if you like. Uh, but it is uh, 8.32 and we do want to be respectful of the time that you have put in to this session uh, and so finish on time. So uh, I guess there's just a, a couple of things. Uh, first and foremost, uh, thank you uh, to Megan for being our guide for this session. Uh, thank you to the Transition Banyal Network for putting on this event um, and uh, the other events that have happened through this, uh, this session. Uh, thank you to all of you for your attention and your focus uh, and your ideas and your questions. Uh, I hope you've all got something out of it. I hope you feel a little bit more energy to go out and uh, grow, compost, shade, or just do whatever it is that, that brings you a bit of joy. Uh, do take care of that double zero self-care stuff, particularly now when we're, things are changing and we're all a little bit exhausted of lockdown um, and make sure that you take care of your, I don't know what, uh, what your kids and your family and your friends are, uh, whether they're like, you know, one and a half zero, but uh, yeah, self-care and, and care of others as well. So thank you for your participation. Thank you for your time. Please look after yourself and we'll see you next time we have a session. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.